Welcome to the Contrarian Investor Podcast. We give voice to those who challenge a prevailing sentiment in global financial markets. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests were not compensated for their appearance, nor do they supply payment in order to appear. Individuals on this podcast may hold positions in the securities that are discussed. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. This podcast episode may have ads and the occasional announcement. To listen without ads or announcements and take advantage of a host of other benefits, consider becoming a premium subscriber. Visit the website contrarian.supercast.tech. That's T E C H for more information. Now, here's your host, Mr. Nathaniel E. Baker. Chris Bemis of X Cubed Capital in Minneapolis, Minnesota that you started with Andrew Redleaf, formerly of White Box. And uh, I believe you were formerly of White Box as well, is that right? I was. And yeah, we're gonna talk about that in a bit, but I wanna start here with a view that you have on markets that can maybe has to be viewed as contrarian. And that is your view of regional banks. And we're not talking the stocks of regional banks, but we're talking credit. But this, the premise is the same, which is that you view the risk in this trade no longer towards default for these regional banks. Uh, is that correct? And if so, tell me how you got there, because this goes back a couple of months. You're telling correct me correct yeah. the qualifier that I'll add at the end. Yeah, go uh, ahead. So we've been interested in the space since September of 22. At the time, when we looked at uh, smaller banks in general, we identified that they carried significant interest rate exposure risk that we felt the market was underappreciating. We put on a trade, long big banks, where we could really do the deep dive and, and hone in on exactly this, uh, this mispricing, this interest rate exposure mispricing. We went long big banks, short small banks through options. Uh, at the time, again, slightly contrarian uh, in that it wasn't part of the general discussion. It wasn't part of the, the gestalt of how we were understanding markets um, as a collective. That trade was profitable through the end of 22, but really saw its biggest gains as we moved into March of 23 and Silicon Valley Bank's uh, failure. We did not have the view that a Silicon Valley bank would be insolvent. Um, that wasn't really part of where we thought the trade was, but it worked in our favor at the time. We, after the failure of Silicon Valley bank, uh, the market did what I generally refer to as started reading the labels of every package off the shelf. Yeah. Uh, and fear kind of took over as uh, what risks may be under the hood. We kept our powder dry from you know, March to April as the dust settled around analysis on regionals in general. What we found though, going into May of this year was that uh, credit was extremely mispriced relative to a triangle of credit, volatility, and equity. In particular, in our analysis, a lot of what we end up looking at is uh, informed by a structural model approach where you see a bond as being short of put and long some cash. Um, so, and that's overly simplistic, but I think it's, it's a good guideline for how to understand credit in general. Prior to the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, we noted that the mispricing between credit and volatility and equity was about $14,000 per million if you just restricted yourself to FINS. After the failure, that number blew out to about $45,000 per million, which you find very attractive. However, uh, we still uh, noted and were aware of the potential jump to default risk in a single name. So the attractiveness is not in necessarily one name in particular. I think, I think that would um, strain credulity 
um, even maybe even today, but especially back in May. Hmm. And so what our analysis drove us to was if you could diversify your exposure in regionals um, hedged with volatility and equity, there's a ton of money on the table. Um, and that's that's been a trade we put on mid-May, has worked out really well within the first few weeks. Um, and we expect that there's a lot of runway left there as well. Very interesting. Can you talk to us a, a little bit more about the, the mispricings that you saw? And you noted some, you, you quoted some numbers there. Yeah. Yeah. How exactly does that work between, you said between vol, credit, and equity? Yeah. So uh, I know this is jumping the gun a little bit, but it'll give some insight into why I think this way. My background is as a mathematician. Hmm. Um, and the work I've done, the majority of my career is in quantitative modeling. And the modeling that we uh, utilize is bespoke, made internally within within our firm. But its main driver is just relating credit spreads to volatility and equity moves, um, which is, you know, could be overly simplistic. Oftentimes that's done just by saying, um, you know, in a lot of capital structure trades, that's done by saying, I want to hedge down to a recovery, right? So you you take a bond and these you, you hedge out some equity down to 40 cents of recovery or, or something like that. What we do internally though is replicate a bond uh, with options and equity, mm-hmm. which there's some math that says that that should be possible. And we think that, and have seen that in terms of PL, that that is exactly the case. So in this specific example, uh, in relating individual bonds to uh, the equity in the cap structure and the uh, options that point to that equity, we found that lo and behold, spreads were way too wide relative to what equity markets were pricing and what uh, the volatility or the options market was pricing. And so in part, our view was on a relative basis, there's attractiveness in the single names. Uh, We also are a very thesis-driven fund. Uh, We we leverage quant a lot, but we're thesis-driven. And the thesis here is that markets tend to overreact. So this Mm -hmm. path from uh, contrarian uh, mm-hmm. for the namesake of your podcast to uh, success of the trade. So knowing that small banks were under pressure to the market is overpricing the risk in small banks, especially in relative pricing of the options and equity markets um, was part of just process in general. Uh, but like I said, we still were cautious um, of jump to default risk. So while you may find some error in mispricing between credit and uh, equity and volatility, those don't really hold in a jump to default scenario. Mm. So the solution there is not, you know, is not one that others might not think of. It's that you want to diversify away that risk. So we felt the best uh, way to express a trade like that to mitigate that jump to default risk was via a basket. So taking 10 to 15 uh, names on the regional side in credit, um, mapping out our expectation in each name, then aggregating that to the basket, and then hedging within the capital structure on the other side. The other side being the large cap banks. Well, yeah, in this case, we actually, uh, that's a great question. Um, In this case, we actually did a mix of uh, S&P because we actually felt that the market in general was was mispriced in this space. Um, And then some of like an XLF or or some of the bigger banks as well. Interesting. Okay. And so how how liquid are those uh, credits and... Uh, the bank credits that you trade and how much of an issue is that? Uh, it wasn't in this case. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it, we had no trouble getting on the sizes that we want um, and could exit, you know, very quickly as well. So the, these were highly liquid, um, really just priced out of uncertainty um, as opposed to, you know, true or fair value. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. 
Um, so what I'm curious, what kind of uh, signals did you see that made you going back to September? You touched on it before. Yeah, it, that's great. Yeah, I love that. Uh, it helps that uh, our founder owns a bank. Uh, so no, having the ins and outs of uh, the community bank, which he uh, is privy to and, and involved with, uh, motivated the analysis of others. Hmm. So in aggregating our view, the motivation was from experience, which is always a, a nice place to start a trade. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Yeah, Andrew Redleaf has been on this podcast before, by the way, in the very early days. And I believe you did talk about regional banks, of course, back then regional banks were, you know, who cared? <laughs> but, yeah, but, yeah but exactly. So, yeah. That, and that, that, that is kind of uh, how these trades that get the label of contrarian exactly. tend to go, it seems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's fascinating. But now it's, I mean, regional banks have, I mean, just at least the vanilla equities have gone pretty, they've been rallying pretty strongly the last couple of weeks. But you still think, I mean, the equity aside, you think there's still upside, more upside in the credit? In the credit, in the credit specifically. Yes. Yeah. Which is a little more protected than the equity. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so that is there is that caveat that this is. Yeah, I I would be hesitant to uh, endorse the equity portion of that trade. Okay, it's just too risky. Yeah, but yeah, for me. Yeah, no, fair, fair, fair. Okay, and this of course begs the question: if you're picking up any other signals now about this kind of mispriced risk, you know, it's an interesting time here. We have inflation. We have the Fed standing pat but only for a bit. We have tech stocks going nuts, AI stocks. You know, I feel like it's 1999 here for those of you old enough to remember that. Maybe uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe 95. It's, a, okay. it's, like the, it's like the beginning of the seeds of a, uh, of a, of a bubble. Do you think? Uh, yes, but I'll qualify that with that. Not so much as uh, something I would make a trade on. Sure. Uh, we actually are more bullish on mid cap than uh, mega cap um, and have a, a handful of equity portfolios that reflect that. Hmm. Okay. Any particular sectors in mid cap? Uh, no, actually, we think it's a, a more broad based uh, approach. So, you know, within, within some of the equity portfolios that we run, uh, we're diversified across names, really not. Uh, trying to identify sector picking, um, but the names that we find interesting tend to be more in the mid-cap space. Hmm, that's fascinating. Okay. Um, okay, let's, uh, why don't we take a quick break here? And I want to come back and you touched on your background a little bit, but I want to ask you some more about that and more about this firm, X Cubed Capital, because there's a, a strong quantitative element there, which is te technically something that's hard to discuss on a podcast, but we're going to give it a try. Um, but we'll be right back. If you're a premium subscriber, don't touch the dial. You do not get the break. Everybody else, if you want to become a premium subscriber, visit the website contrarianpod.substack.com and sign up. We hope you're enjoying this episode of the Contrarian Investor Podcast, where we give voice to those who challenge a prevailing narrative in global financial markets. Consider becoming a premium subscriber. For $9 a month or less, premium subscribers receive a number of benefits. Podcasts are posted immediately after they're recorded. Transcripts are made available within 24 hours. Premium subscribers get direct access to the host. And of course, there are no ads or interruptions. Visit contrarian.supercast.tech for more information. By the way, you don't need the .tech suffix to get to that website dot com will do the trick and we also have a sub stack that you can where you can sign up for the same prices same benefits same details contrarianpod.substack.com so if you already have a sub stack account and use it or have the app and use that that's probably the best way to go so contrarian.supercast.com or contrarianpod.substack.com, whole bunch of benefits, 
including, of course, getting this episode up to a week early without ads or annoying announcements. And you also get the Daily Contrarian briefing and podcast that is released every market day morning at 7 a.m. This is a contrarian take on the events of the day ahead and what is likely to move markets, such as economic data releases, earnings, and other things. It is really good, and that is completely unbiased, of course. So check that out, contrarianpod.substack.com or contrarian.supercast.tech. Now on with the show. Welcome back, everybody, here with Chris Bemis, co-founder of X-Cubed Capital out there in Minneapolis. So this is the segment of, of the podcast where we talk about our guests' background, how they came to arrive at this uh, at this stage of their career. You touched on it. You have a maths background. So yeah, take us back and, and talk to us how you came about investing in the first place and how you came to, to start this firm. Yeah, so my background is you know in the in the bona fide mathematician category uh have a phd in applied math uh always interested in a financial application and naively when you study a lot of math you don't know exactly what that might turn into it someday um as a quick aside at the time when i was finishing my phd the space of math finance which i teach at the university here uh, presently in uh, was not so codified as to identify, you know, a direct path for somebody mm. with my background. So I took a somewhat circuitous route, uh, did some work for uh, GMAC RFC, uh, you know, wrote a thesis that, you know, as a mathematician felt was interesting uh, for uh, finance and ended up uh, working with Andy directly after uh, my PhD, actually slightly before I defended that, and did the gamut. R ran some long short equity uh, portfolios, uh, built out a quantitative group uh, within my past firm, uh, was ahead of that. And then towards the end of my tenure there, uh, really got an interest in systematic credit, uh, pricing credit, uh, both in the cross section, meaning like how, how is one credit price uh, relative to another and within its own capital structure. And I particularly like that. I think, I think it's really interesting. I think it's uh, a place, you know, it's, it's one of those things that gets you out of bed in the morning. Um, and I saw it's, it's a, place with a lot of opportunity in the coming years. Um, you know, if you, if you want to find nickels on the street, um, it's, it's a great uh, area of interest. Hmm. Uh, so ran, ran a quant group, went down the systematic credit direction. We, we were running a pretty big portfolio uh, up through the pandemic. Uh, and like a lot of people at the time, uh, took that time to uh, evaluate what I wanted to do with my life and uh, left my past firm uh, and, you know, slight interjection, thought I'm going to have a really nice garden leave and relax. And the universe said, how about you get cancer? And so I got okay. cancer for like six months. Oh my God. Uh, and then uh, Andy uh, had been out of white box for two or three years and uh his his contractual obligation not to have a fund was ending and we started having conversations about what might be interesting and you know like you said we're, we're very quantitatively uh informed we which we, we tend to say something like quantitative rigor instead of a, a quant fund uh and that has become what we are today, uh, which is trying to make worldview thesis-driven trading uh, systematic and scalable. Uh, and I think we've had success in, in doing that thing. So presently, I'm our managing partner at uh, X-Cubed, um, but also responsible for building our infrastructure and the, the you know, the core skeleton of, of how we look at the world. Hmm. Interesting. And I mentioned uh, that this is a multi-strategy uh, firm and you have a, a kind of a unique approach there. 
where it's it's not multi-manager, right? There's an important distinction there. So tell me about that. Yeah, we think that there's an opportunity in what would have in the early 2000s be, been seen as just the regular way multi-strat. And why we think that there's an opportunity there is because the success of the multi-manager platforms have reduced by design, and it's it's a hallmark of their success, cross-asset fluency. Mm -hmm. uh, pods are constructed so that they don't talk amongst each other, mm. um, which has a real benefit for uh, the multi-manager platforms. But we think that the result of that is that those places uh, in the seams between pricings of asset classes uh, have left money on the table. Um, and, you know, quite honestly, I find it aesthetically interesting, mm -hmm. uh, this, this idea of, of pricing across asset classes. Within the firm, uh, we have a particular penchant for pricing through the lens of volatility. Um, and that's like I, I've already mentioned, that's really accretive in any credit analysis, um, but also finds a home in uh, options as a standalone asset class. Interesting. And so the now the trading that you do, it's like I said, capital structure, specific tranches, I guess, of the credit, uh, potentially against each other, right? Um, and you say that you're you're quite bullish on this strategy going forward and that it's scalable. Is there a way to replicate this on the, on the retail side? Or is this just something for institutions like you, you think? It's a good question. Uh, I don't know if I have a good answer to that. Okay. Well, that's good. That's uh, a fair answer. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, I, I was surprised uh, when I left uh, my last firm, uh, just how nascent the space of doing work in systematic credit is. Um, so if if it is possible, which you know there's really not that much barrier, it's one of those places, and there's an anecdote that I particularly like about uh, Edison going to Ford's plant and spending only a handful of minutes and, and putting an X on, on one of the support beams and saying, this is where you need to put your, uh, your breaker for, for their electric build out. And he sends, uh, he sends forward a bill for at the time, like something like $10,000, which was, you know, a lot, a lot in today's dollars. And Ford said, look, you were only there for like 30 minutes. How can you, how can you charge me this much? And he said, I'm not charging for my time. I'm telling, I'm charging you for, uh, knowing where to put the X. Yeah. So I think this, I think this kind of falls in that same category um, in, in the sense of if, if you know how to, how or where to put the X, yeah. uh, it becomes, it becomes a different enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. Having said that, I mean, where does one even f find out pricing on these instruments? It's not like, well, you know, a lot program. of the, a lot of the stuff that we look at is, is public. I mean, we're, we're okay. a highly liquid uh, firm. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at publicly traded uh, credit and then you know obviously public equity and and options. Um, it's really I think uh, a question of interest. Um, yeah, asking yourself the question of can you price one of these uh, points on the triangle um, with respect to the other two? Um, and that area of interest, like I said, I think is somewhat precluded by construction um, in the current uh, market, especially in the hedge fund market. Um, so, you know, so long as there's interest, I think it's possible and we find it very interesting. Like what kind of things would you, would you look for? Is there something obvious? I mean, it sounds like obviously there's a lot of special sauce in here, but as far as, I mean, you talk about credit spreads, what kind of, what kind of screens do you have? Like, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I built out a, uh, it, it's been a, it's been a manic period having a startup and, uh, building things out over the past year within credit, we look at a really big uh, universe every day of uh, bonds against their volatility and equity. So we screen about 600 names every night. Uh, we look in CDS for the same. 
we look at basis packages, um, but basis really in the view of having some vega or or volatility sensitivity and delta, some some uh, uh, equity sensitivity, meaning that uh, basis in general is something that people identify as having a liquidity premium and that that can be priced via uh, options and equity. Uh, we look at some relative spreads. So we're really looking at these things that we think have, pardon the the, the, the Latin here, but an a priori reason to exist. Um, a lot of the quantitative work ends up having something that feels a bit black boxy. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you, you don't necessarily know what the model is saying. Um, what we've done internally is try, and again, this is part of that intention of building a thematic worldview uh, firm that's process driven and scalable. What we've done on the quantitative side is really just try to reflect those views we would have as investors with a lot of gray hair. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the results end up looking very interpretable. I mean, they're, mm -hmm. they're essentially as simple as uh, what was done in the late 60s, uh, early 70s in the option space of saying, you know, an option has some vega and some delta, and this is how one ought to price an option as a function of some portion of, of equity. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just doing the same thing in credit. Sick of me yet? Become a premium subscriber and avoid all ads or interruptions. Other benefits as well. Visit contrarian.supercast.tech for more information. And so you speak of your thematic worldview. Is there, are there any other uh, themes, bigger picture that you can talk to that you're seeing right now? You said, you know, before, it's yeah. sim similar, you know, we've been very bearish, uh, anything that touches on office space. Uh, right. If you had, if we had done this podcast, uh, you know, 14 months ago, uh, we, we would have counted as contrarian there being short office space uh, against, you know, what we think are great credits, um, in particular, just single asset, single borrower credits. Uh, we're bullish home builders, uh, you know, in that same vein, if there's too much office space, there's too little homes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, the, the rest of what we look at right now is uh, mispricings in a somewhat fearful market. The the bullish runs we've had very recently in the equity markets notwithstanding. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like, you know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but there could be maybe more upside here in, in these markets. Yeah. You know, I, I, I tend to not prognosticate. Uh, mm -hmm. what, I, what I try to uh, restrict myself to is uh, those places where we find a uh, an economic, statistical, or thematic uh, mispricing uh, between asset classes, or you know, maybe maybe within a capital structure, and what I, I will say without qualification is, those are plentiful right now. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we Fair. have opportunities in SKU, opportunities in credit, um, opportunities in calendar spreads. In general, the market's pricing of volatility in the general sense. So, credit options. Um, is rife with opportunity. Mm -hmm. So yeah, talk to me some more about this this office space idea because I guess so you're not buying the return to office narrative at all that a lot of firms have been trying. You to know, I, you know, if you look at what we're doing right now, uh, and you know, sure. eighty or ninety percent of the calls I'm on uh, for work, uh, we have moved to a place where the capacity that was needed for office space is not justifiable mm -hmm. uh, anymore. And if there's a return, it's not a return to 100%. And you know, I did some analysis back in uh, early 22, tracking cell phone data, and it really looks like the usage in office space is leveled out at about two thirds to 70% of what it was pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. That doesn't sound that significant, um, but it is catastrophic to some tranches uh, within, say, CDX. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need that many losses uh, to accumulate mm -hmm. to have massive wins on the downside, uh, yeah. being being short that space. Um, so no, don't I don't buy it, and I think there's still a ton of potential there. Yeah, yeah, and we've seen certain regions, especially San Francisco, 
uh, kind of having a hard time. Uh, some headlines here the other day. About yeah, that's very generous. That, that wasn't offices, kind of. but yeah. 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 Um, so on that, uh, yeah, you talked about, uh, you touched on this cell phone data. Talk to me about that and how you harness that data to. to sure. Yeah. Inform. So everything we end up doing, again, like I said, we we try to focus on quantitative rigor. And there's, there's places where uh, a regular way quant screen doesn't necessarily apply. So in this identification of the opportunity in uh, being short office spaces, one of the things that we did, you know, we think it's, it was one of those worldview driven trades that we think is some, was somewhat obvious to us. Uh, but again, the market not necessarily agreeing uh, a year ago. But one of the ways we leveraged doing some quantitative analysis was to aggregate uh, geofenced cell phone data uh, that was identified per uh, per office space or retail space within some of the series within CMBX. So we knew what the loans were. We knew what their addresses were. We were able to look at a time series of uh, pings of cell phone data entering and exiting, mm. spending time in them, et cetera. Uh, and the net result of that was something that really solidified our view. And that was that you had recovery across the board in retail space. Uh, and really ge geographically, that, that was across the United States. But within office spaces, we could identify those places that were seeing the most stress, uh, seeing the least recovery, and reaching their level um, in the post-pandemic world. Uh, and then the next step was constructing a trade that isolated those exposures. Mm. That's fascinating, yeah. Because this, I mean, anecdotally, anybody who's been near a, a mall well, maybe an outdoor mall or any retail outlet in the U.S. can say that there's no slowdown. I mean, the, these places are packed. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting to, for you to quantify that. Um, and this data is publicly available? No, this was a okay. partnership that we we made with another firm. I see. Uh, do you make use of satellite data at all? I have not. I found mm -hmm. some interested in, in it historically, um, but in previous incarnations of my work, I didn't even find it marginally accretive to the other signals that you might get from, from the market. Um, where I think our firm now distinguishes itself from my past work is that uh, if we take as table stakes having some quantitative analysis for every trade we look at, it opens up the toolbox to having marginal gains for one specific trade. Uh -huh. And so this, this analysis of uh, cell phone data, I think usually is pitched for you know, cross-sectional analysis or, or broad-based trading in general. Um, we found it to be useful for this one instance, and that's, hmm. that's uh, emblematic of our approach in general. Hmm. I have to ask about AI, hot topic of the year or whatever. Um, any ways that you're using that yet? Uh, no, I have done work in the past. I think uh, my hat as a mathematician guides a lot of my thinking here. Uh, I'll share an anecdote that I think is uh, appropriate for the application of AI in finance. And it's that uh, if you train uh, something with a, a neural net in, in a reinforcement learning uh, framework, to play chess. Within a day, given today's computing power, you can beat all humans mm -hmm. handily. Uh, humans can't compete playing chess against something trained that way. What's fascinating and uh, I think instructive about that is that if you then say, let's let the knights move like rooks, and you let that same amazing bit of code play against humans, um, a five-year-old will beat it. Okay. And this is so part of the fabric of AI that it has a name and it's called catastrophic forgetting. Mm. Uh, we think that markets are dynamic enough to give pause to the application of AI mm. uh, in finance.
Yeah, that's really interesting. But yet you still are looking for a, a link, I guess, between academic finance, academic math and yeah. finance. Yeah, and it's a, it's a, I think it's a great contrast. We're in an AI approach tends to say, let's build an artificial uh, structure to relate inputs to some output. So some supervised learning approach says, let's let's have the inputs match the match these outputs, and the computer can say how those ought to relate to each other. What that ends up doing in general is overfitting to the past in finance. Yeah. Um, and there's, I think, several examples where you can find that. Probably the most uh, readily available is like in something like a, a Zillow's efforts in uh, pricing homes and then buying them via their modeling, which failed. Where there's a distinction then is this idea that the exercise of math modeling of financial assets is, in my opinion, uh, best supported by the approach of having a worldview, a priori view of what the relationships should be and imposing that on. That's not possible in the AI setting. Right. You can't impose a view in an AI setting readily. There, there might be some workarounds on that, but not readily. So the contrast ends up being one that says, uh, fit very well to history, given free parameters on any relationships that might obtain, versus saying to a model, this is the relationship that should exist. Now tell me if there's a mispricing. And it's in the latter place that I think there's more opportunity for identifying uh, alpha. Yeah, that's really interesting. So then there, there would then need to be an additional screen of human intelligence that make them absolutely make thanks thanks for laying that up for me i think our marketing people would have been upset that i uh, <laughs> didn't say that at the outset uh absolutely so if there's three if there's three tiers to how we look at things it's that worldview quantitative analysis and then especially because we're in the space of you know credit and options having a high touch market facing uh component is critical um, mm -hmm. Computers don't know if prices are wrong as inputs, so garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. uh, being able to execute uh, efficiently near mids is another piece, a real relationship business on the on the credit side, and so on. Um, so letting a computer do whatever it want in financial markets, I think, has a has a place, um, but not a place uh, mm -hmm. where uh, where where we built. Yeah, I mean, anecdotally, having covered hedge funds. We've seen this a lot over the years, going back a while, like 10 or 15 years even. Yes. It seems every couple of years is a big story about X firm hiring all these quants and, and NLP and, and AI and all this stuff. And, and then you never hear from it again because it doesn't quite I think there's out. a reason for that. Which is just what you explained or something else? Uh, what I explained, and if the successes were there, you'd hear more of it. Of course. Yeah, I know that as well as I mean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think the most ready... Uh, contrast is if you look at the publication history in the late 90s through the early 2000s on equity anomalies and how mm -hmm. many researchers got picked up by funds, um, by way of contrast, you don't see the same thing happening uh, on the AI side. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for our uh, you know students, be they grad students or even undergrads who might be math majors or, or something and are watching this, what can you recommend as a course of study that would not to be hired by you personally, but to uh, segue into the world of investing in finance for these? Uh, you know, the thing I always tell people, uh, having had a, a lot of people come to me asking whether or not they should get a PhD is ultimately find the thing that's most interesting to you. Okay. Uh, on the, on the math side, uh, if, if finance is interesting, uh, Mathematicians have a general tendency to think they can do everything, uh, but for their their time and effort put in, uh, it's really I think most important to put a little bit of math understanding uh, on the back seat and understand the market, mm -hmm. the language, the approach, uh, because the history of successes in financial markets 
are not uh, solely the outcome of some analytic ability. Um, and those places are very interesting, especially for what is usually termed an industrial mathematician. Uh, so, you know, find, if I were to give a recommendation, it'd be find, find what's interesting and uh, learn the language and, and be a little humble. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. And that kind of segue that also, uh, you know, works with your theme of there needing to be a human element here to this whole investing approach. Markets are rational beasts, as we know, and they can stay irrational longer than a lot of us can stay solvent. Yeah. So really interesting conversation here with Chris Bemis of X Cubed Capital. In closing, is there, how can we, um, yeah, how would people go about finding more out about you, about the firm, anything you've published? Sure. Uh for those interested on the math side, there's a handful of places you could find uh, a bit of published work. Uh, if you just Google my name okay. on something like, uh, you know, any of the, the archive places. With respect to the firm, uh, we've got an alphabet soup of a, a, a website or URL, uh, X3CM LLC. So X, X Cube Capital Management LLC uh, oh, cool. is is our website. Uh, we have a link there for, uh -huh. for those interested. Cool, and, but no social media presence? No, no. Yeah. Uh, I Actually, I, I should know, Andy has a podcast. Andy um, does have a podcast. Yeah. yeah. Which, uh, not just uh, talking my book, I find interesting. Yeah, okay, I will link to that. I'll ask Amara about that. That'd be awesome. She, I'm sure she told me at some point, but okay. Awesome. Well, this has been really interesting, Chris Bemis. Thank you so much for coming on the Contrarian Investor Podcast today. It was awesome to have you. Look forward to having you back here again, maybe in a year or so. We love the it. Markets will be completely different then. We have we'll have some more opportunities, some timely opportunities. Until then, we leave you. We'll see you back here again next week. And with that, we thank you for listening. See you then. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Contrarian Investor Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. To subscribe to this podcast, simply open your favorite podcast software and search for Contrarian Investor. Follow us on social media by searching for Contrarian Investor on Twitter and Instagram. Send us your thoughts on feedback at contrarianpod.com. We look forward to speaking to you again next time.